Well, hello there, good looking. You look like you care about preserving your body and soul. And by that, I mean wrapping that sexy body in some nice ass merch. Protecting your valuables with tote bags and phone cases. And just in general, like a person that might make some great choices today. If that does sound like you, check the links below. Promo code PODBAM. This is the merch corner. Hey, <laughs> bye now. On to the episode. Return of the make. Mm-mm. Turn of the make. You knew that I'd be back. You knew it. You knew it. Did you miss me? I missed this. I missed this. As I probably mentioned, I uh, actually sit, have like my podcast corner, which doesn't make any fucking sense because I have to turn the sofa, but I like to turn it and look out of the window, which again means I'm looking at like the sky or like something that says timber yard. Yeah, my, give them the address. Like, you forgot how this is done, for fuck's sake. But hi, welcome to the month of weird. Yet again, nobody asked for these cases. Maya's back. By all means necessary, is back. You know, did you feel the gap? Like, with just the minisodes? Did you feel that I was gone and, like, you know, there wasn't, like, hours of content to just consume? You motherfucking consumption... Consumators consumers my consumers freak before i tell you what this month is all about and you know the cases we're gonna cover the motives we're gonna get to the bottom of right right because we are all qualified here i came back with that energy energy levels are up yeah i need to take a break like every few months just so you know <laughs> little energy levels to like level for months wow that was so nicely worthy wow, write a book maya write a book so during this week off, of course, I've done so so little, <laughs> but I've discovered two things that I have to actually mention at the beginning of the episode because they're like actively changing my life. I am not even fucking lying. You know, I wouldn't give you a shitty recommendation, okay? If you love this podcast, like you will truly enjoy Christina Randall's YouTube channel. I have never been like so immersed immediately, and it's just so humane. Basically. So Christina is like an ex-convict. She was in prison for like three years when she was 21. She turned her life around and is now like super famous on YouTube. And she just honestly talks about her prison experience. And it's... I don't even know how to put it. It's everything from like comparing Orange is the New Black to prison experience to like, hey, this is how you survive, I don't know, your period. This is what you use instead of makeup. This is what outfits people wear in jail versus prison. But I think what I love the most is how humane and honest it is, but in such a way that it's like, she's just telling you this is my experience, but through that you just know that it's so deterring of you committing crime. I mean, all of you loving makeup, if you see what she uses to even remotely like try to look humane, like add some you know, color it's some makeup and like what she actually used to do in prison. Like you will never commit a crime. You will be like every time, you know, you're about to make a bad decision, you'll be like, mm, no. Just in general, if you like food, she like makes all these fucking weird recipes that, well, are the only things that you could make with like prison ingredients or like, hey, this is, I'm eating prison food for the whole day. And you just say like, I'm gonna barf. Or for me personally, I don't know why, but this resonated with me so well, was this video where she is like rating um, costumes, rating like prison outfits, and she's like, yeah, this is what you wear here, this is what you wear there, like shoes, all of this, like it's disgusting, you inherit it from somebody that used to wear it for like 10 years. And she's like, and these are the bras. And immediately in my head I was like, why did I think that they have the option not to wear a bra? This is not like me getting away with it at a silent meditation session where like the nun kind of approach me is like, can you fucking wear a bra? Like, you know, but she didn't say fucking, but yeah. But I'm like, this is a prison. Like you cannot get away without wearing a bra and like just in general underwear, which I don't like wearing anyway. So I'm like, oh my God, this for me, this was it. I was like, no. Anger management issues need to be sorted the fuck out. So that's the first recommendation. Like, if you are into true crime, but actually want somebody giving you, like, a perception of, like, hey, this is actual prison life. She was in prison in Florida, so it's, like, American prison life. I wonder, I thought, like, at first she was British. I don't know why, just from the looks. But I wonder, yeah, if somebody does it here. Please, if you know British YouTubers who have done the same, let me know. I'm all about this shit. 
<laughs> in a completely unhealthy way, yes. I'm the person that would go into prison to like interview prisoners. We all know I want to pick their fucking brains. Second recommendation is if you're into comedy. So you can kind of skip like a minute <laughs> if you're not. But yeah, still equally great for me. Because it's like helping me discover like all of these comedians. And I just like the ideas because there are some comedians obviously they're overrated. Everybody knows, everybody watches their specials on Netflix. So there's this podcast called Netflix is a Daily Joke and it just basically takes like a joke from any stand-up that's on Netflix and kind of puts it into like, hey, daily three minutes or however many minutes the joke lasted. And yep, it's just a true gem because I'm like, hey, I need comedy, but also I love the ideas. I'm like, yep, they're not all the same. Like they make all these different comedies. Also, it's like international people and everything. I'm like, oh, this is soothing. This is nice. Except that means I try to listen to it before sleep and then my brain is like trying to interact with it and actually pay attention. <sighs> it's been a great holiday. It's been a great week. It's like I, I did leave the house as well, you know, unlike the popular opinion. But now we are back. I'm bringing you the month of... I was, I was like, okay, for October I planned something big because I just like to put some extra work into my birthday month. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that person will give herself like extra research to do like when she should fucking technically chill. So for September I was like, okay, this needs to be light, but also needs to be something super intriguing. What is one thing that you know nothing about? Like zilch, absolute zilch. And you also can not completely comprehend the motives. I know, art. And what do people do with art? They fucking steal it. So we are talking about art thefts here. Can you pronounce the word theft? Can you pronounce TH? No. It's a running joke. Yes. I know you're screaming into your headphones because of the way I am pronouncing theft. And you're gonna hear a lot of it, okay? I'm an immigrant. Deal with it. But stick with me now because you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna steal it from money or whatever, okay? Like, we've done robberies before, bitch. First of all, no, you don't just steal art just for money, like, sick. But also, I'm gonna be covering just the famous cases because this is not like, I don't know, some niche things or like hostage or kidnapping or sadism, which I'm very familiar with and I'm like, okay, cool, I can go into, you know, some unknown cases here. No, I'm not an art podcast, as you very well know. <laughs> So we are starting off with one of the biggest robberies, art thefts, t thefts. And that is the one of the painting, The Scream. You know about it? You know about it. There's even emoji of it that I use frequently, too frequently, if you ask anybody. It's that very unsettling painting of a person just slowly losing their mind that you can't just have in your fucking room and look at it. I wonder how many of you actually have like a copy of this painting and just, yeah, have it in like your living room. Are you okay? when you look at it, yeah, on a daily basis, do you, do, are you not slowly going mad? And this case is so full of twists and turns, because the robber in itself is just like the dullest 60 seconds kind of process, but then it's the recovery of it. It even includes a British spy. That's what I'm bringing you motherfuckers today. So let's dive in. On 12th of February 1994, the screen painting by Edwin Munch was stolen from the National Gallery in Oslo by Paul Anger and his gang. The United Forces of the British and the Norwegian police will introduce a spy to recover the painting by all means necessary. What motivated the robbery? this you know you work at a gallery in Oslo you're like yeah it's a pretty chill life you know you're just unlocking the doors one day and you see this note on the floor that says a thousand thanks for the bad security and you're like okay I thought this was gonna be an easy shift <laughs> you know that awkward feeling when you kind of like log in for work and you're like oh it's busy I did not want you to be busy today I cannot mentally deal with this yeah that's that was that kind of day but because this is happening in Oslo, Norway, you know, and not like here in the UK where people will just immediately have anger management problems and lose their fucking minds, they're like, but it's a painting. They immediately got worried something is gonna happen to the painting. They weren't like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get fucking sacked for this shit. So, you know, they do the usual, they call the police, they're like, hey, somebody look into this, let's just check security, right? 
There's a video of this online, as I mentioned, it's literally like 50 seconds. It's not even a whole minute. So you see that sexy 94 black and white footage. You see two thieves that just put the ladder up. Then one of them sort of like climbs up the ladder, breaks the window, gets the painting that at the time was worth at least 55 million. Then, you know, goes down the ladder. The other one that was kind of on the lookout, you know, just squashes that leather, whatever you call it, okay? Yes, he squashes the leather. The leather and he's like, hey, yo, did you leave the postcard, like, with a thanks for the pure security? He's like, yeah, mate, let's fuck off from here. And then they go. Now, these two have most probably scouted the gallery prior to this, because what was going on at the time was the Olympic Games. Norway was hosting the Olympics for that year. So because of the tourism and because of like everybody coming in, right, to track this famous painting, they moved it from like upstairs to the ground floor. So they knew that this was technically going to be like super easy access and it's going to be super quick. So somebody probably went into the gallery, you know, did like their sightseeing a couple of days before the robbery. And the gallery obviously had to comment on this and they were like, well, yeah, we kind of did it for like tourism, but we also thought, you know, putting the cameras and the alarm system is going to be sufficient. So the alarm did go off and then these guards that I mentioned at the beginning of the story came in together with the police, but the thieves were long gone and they actually used the wire cutters. So further kind of going into my story of like they knew even how it was hung on the walls that they knew like what would be the quickest way to get the fuck out of there. I love all of the press releases from this story. I don't even know why. I think it's just like 94 and nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. And some of them are just big. Some of them are just the funniest things. So the museum director, Knut Berg. Knut. Knut. It's the cutest name. Knut and Sven. Sven. Yeah, y if you know a Sven, you know where they're from. <laughs> Do you know a Sven? If you don't know a Sven, then be a Sven. There's no other way to life. Either know a Sven or be a Sven. I wish this was the dumbest thing I'm gonna say this whole episode. So he basically said, um, released the statement being like, hey, even though this is invaluable, and it's like most valuable thing, like this painting by Munch, it would be almost impossible to sell. And this is the one thing that people don't portray well in like movies and shit, and it's like completely the opposite. So if you were to sell something like the Scream legally, yes, you would get what I said, like 55 millions, or yeah, you can auction it for, you know, more or less. But now it's stolen. So first of all, who'd buy it? But then it's kind of, it's completely worthless as well. So you'd kind of really be at risk just buying it as well, because also it's public news that it's stolen. So it's stolen goods. So you're technically like a criminal for buying it for however much you want to offer. The problem with this particular painting, the problem with the scream at this particular point was that it wasn't insured against theft. <laughs> Why it wasn't insured? You're like, that's particularly fucking dumb. It's like a super famous painting. It's because it was nearly impossible to set a price on it. So, obviously here, this is not the great news for the gallery or just for the police in general, because they're like, well, no, like, it's kind of, we're kind of sh in shite. We need to recover this painting. And that this is the best press conference that they have done, because now they're talking about, hey, like, yeah, usually the galleries do have metal detectors, we have armed guards, you know, we have the alarm, we, we are ready, like, every gallery was now on, like, high alert. But the spokesperson, spokeswoman for this gallery said like even that wouldn't stop a violent robbery. And she's basically like, if an armed gang come into the museum with machine guns, there's not a lot that can be done. And then she laughs and adds, the frames on the pieces in the museum are much heavier than those in the museum in Oslo, so they'd at least need more people to carry them away. This is what I'm talking to you about, like, why are we giving them advice? It's like, no, please encourage any other robberies. It's not like the police has this one on their hands. Like, tell them there's more people. You need more than you. <laughs> so now the recovery bit. So as I mentioned, like, this was kind of put, well, National Gallery in shit. Because now it's like, well, you're kind of a liability. Like, people are just stealing your painting in 50 seconds. <laughs> Sounds great. And this obviously grabs interest by weirdest organizations, okay? Okay, and this, uh, this came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but listen to this sentence. So a few days after the theft, yeah, theft, yeah, a Norwegian anti-abortion group said um, it could have the painting returned if, like, the main Norwegian television was to show an anti-abortion film. I feel like this is some form of blackmail, but...
that we are not about this anti-abortion life also what the fuck and well for a month they kind of didn't have many leads they were like yeah we kind of have like a few people that have been stealing art but we can't like physically connect it to them based on just that footage and that's when they receive a ransom letter so the thieves apparently well whoever wrote the ransom letter um, demanded one million for the return of the painting and the gallery is like no but also let's just question the legitimacy of this and they involve scotland yard hey that's where i'm here at no i'm not at the scotland yard but you, you get what i mean right remember how i recommended you to listen to true spies about a few weeks ago it's, yeah, a true crime podcast about, like, spies, but, like, real spies, that's why it's called True Spies. Yeah, this is where this idea came from, because I listened to the episode, I was like, what the actual fuck? So, enter Charles Hill, who is going to be our spy. He worked for the Met Police and was just actually famous for recovering, like, art from the things that people would operate here in London, the UK. And, well, they involved him in this, and they were like, yeah, listen, we need your help. And I love this guy. I listen to interviews with him. He's so cocky. I love him so much. But he's also a bit nuts. And I feel like you need to be, because you are clearly dealing with unstable humans. I feel like you kind of need to have that weird British sense of humor to, like, pull this shit off. This kind of goes to show how they were getting desperate. So Charles actually offers them as a buyer. So he's like, yep, cool, I'm gonna act as a potential buyer. He's like, I'm gonna offer them 250,000 US dollars. And they were willing to accept it. So bear in mind, at auction, the scream would sell for even 120 million. They, in the ransom letter, if we are presuming that it's them, asked for 1 million but we're willing to go even like for a quarter of that. I'm like, okay, tears, okay. So immediately you're like, yeah, we're dealing with like people who just desperately need to get rid of this painting now and that's gonna work for us. So Charles Hill here from the Met kind of looked into, well, who would have done this? And he soon turned to Paul Anger, who was a known thief, but like also he played football for the Norwegian club Balerenga. It's <laughs> just out of every single thing I have read, I was like, oh wow, we have a thief that is also somehow a celebrity. This is actually what I think about often. As I told you, I kind of like verify documents for one of my jobs. So like verify some ID documents and obviously like you need to make sure that they're legit. Otherwise the person is, um, well, gonna steal the fucking equipment. They're just fraud. And I always think like, especially because we have had some like high profile, let's say, frauds and like some people just like getting away with it i'm like but can you not ruin them online if it's somebody with i don't know how many followers or just like with a youtube channel i'm like can you not like literally ruin them and it's kind of that thing where like yeah we try but still if people want to steal it doesn't matter how many followers they have if somebody's a fucking thief they're just gonna go for it I feel like I have just found the ideal position on how to sit in this chair and actually have the full view of the screen, but also be like super close to the mic. Yeah, is this uh, how it felt when I had the first orgasm? <laughs> wow, yeah, sure, of course, of course it did, Maya, of course. <laughs> there are some memories that you just want to keep th th close to you forever and then fresh and very... <laughs> super vivid, you know, that like you want to feel them on your skin forever and ever, but hey... So, back to the story. So, Chief Inspector Life Lear contacts Scotland Yard and uh, he is now in touch with Detective Chief Inspector John Butler. They basically assign Charles Hill and then they assign him kind of like a bodyguard with just like a backup plan. Well, he looked like a bodyguard. Uh, the guy named Sid Walker. And Charles was to become Chris Roberts and even had to change his accent to change it to like as this American accent and he was supposed to be representative for the Getty Museum from California. As Chris Roberts he is to pose and offer them 500,000 for the safe handover of Moon's work. So now they are obviously kind of like preparing the identity for Hill, for Charles Hill or well Chris Roberts. Like, so all the documents and everything. And they're in the meantime looking at anger and being like, okay, what angle do we play here? So it's like, cool, you're not a dealer from, like, the art museum. It's all legit. But it's like, what do we... Why do we think it's him? And, well, anger actually appeared to have stolen another monk's painting called Vampire. 
every single monk's painting is fucking disturbing, okay? It's just, there's something very unsettling about them. I mean, yes, they're masterpieces, every single one of them, but every single one has that dystopian kind of thing, kind of like the Scream does, where, yeah, everything blends together and you're just feeling like you're slowly losing your fucking mind. Now the word is being spread that men from the Getty wants to get hands on the work. Norwegian police is like, yep, it's Paul Anger that we are going after. This new man, Chris Roberts, got his identity, but also kind of worked at his mid-Atlantic accent. And just in general, like the spy skills are like telling like as few lies as possible and only kind of communicating the important information with the thieves. Once he'll make it to Oslo. Now they need like an intermediary. They get introduced to this art dealer and auctioner, Elnar Tore Ulving. His sister worked for the gallery. He offered to be like a go in between, like a go between between the parties. And Ulving arranges for them to meet up with this associate of Palanger, whose name was Jan Olsen. And they are to meet at the Oslo's Plaza Hotel. Now the problem with them, like after looking up Olsen, there was like. All of them were kind of thinking like, okay, cool. There's one guy is like a fucking football player. Jan Olsen is also fit. He's a kickboxing champion. I don't know why these people chose the life of fucking crime, okay? Again, thinking about fucking motivation. They were already okay, doing okay for themselves. So yeah, as I was telling you, it's not just about the money, is it? As they go to meet to this plaza hotel... Well, Hill said, like, the card he played was that he was acting super confident. So he would, you know, walk in all, like, gregarious, like, super loud and acting, like, all super cool and know it all about, like, the art. So that immediately calmed Angar and Olsen down. But there was this one problem, and that was always Sid Walker, because he just looked like an intimidating bodyguard figure in the presence of, like, Charles Hill. So immediately he knew, like, okay, cool, he was reading the room this whole time, you know, during their first meetup. And he kind of immediately said, like, yeah, Sid here used to live in Amsterdam, which apparently impressed Olsen, because, I don't know, like, he thought probably that he was just smoking weed in fucking Amsterdam and is, is chill to hang out with. Because everybody believes, everybody believes a, sm- a weed smoker. You know one thing I can always entrust the weed smoker? Munchies choice. They they know the best snacks. They just know. And it's not even like, okay, this is like a shitty snack that I eat. No, they know what is gonna fill you up as a snack. Mm. No, no, listen, if you if you know somebody <laughs> sideline, but yeah. If you know somebody that like smokes weed on the rag, yeah, go to them for like any snack options. I'm not just talking about munchies in general, I'm just talking like yeah, anything. The snack, the meal between the lunch and dinner and shit. So Charles Hill, or as Chris Roberts now, he has impressed them, he has calmed them down, he has paid for drinks, and well, they all go to like sleep at that hotel. But in the morning, he wakes up and he is terrified to find out that there is Narcotics Officers Association basically having like a raid at the hotel. And well, the hotel is full of police officers, out of which Charles Hill actually knew two of them. So he's there like shitting himself and he's like, okay, I need to go down for breakfast, but if any of those two notices me, they're gonna acknowledge me, like say hi or something. And I can't have that because then that means like I'm connected to the police and that's like the whole purpose. It's just this whole mission is gonna go to shit. So what he does is he calls the reception to call those two out, basically, hey, like, yeah, this is a reception, we have a message for X, Y, Z, and then that person would come to the reception, they would be like, yeah, listen, if you notice Charles Hill, ignore him, like, he's here on a mission. Just like, that is just thinking on your feet, it's super smart. And it's just using the already existent, like, feature that, I don't know, hotels would do. So, you know, like, stuff that you don't think about, like, if your phone battery died in a mall, you could always go to, like, information desk and be like, hey, can my husband, like, report to the information desk because his wife doesn't have a charger or whatever. But it's, like, the things that you kind of are like, okay, what would I do in, like, those situations that, like, I can use something that I have on hand? But, yeah, you don't think about that usually. It's actually funny, like, it's not funny. Um, But I've been 
well when i still fucking pretended that i'm into like startups and stuff and i mean i am truly interested into like some of this shit but the one podcast i listen to i listen to like tim ferris usually but i listen to naval he is like the investor behind ageless i don't know if you ever applied for like jobs and startups that's like the website that you well one of the websites that you can use and he has these like super cool and smart ideas about life and well, one of them is that you will never amass wealth working a job like that brings you a monthly salary. And I'm like, yeah, I know. This is why I'm trying to like save my fucking life, Naval. But another thing is like, there's this whole really short episode. I'll try to find it to like drop it down below. Basically, all about what if like you didn't have your phone, you didn't have your contacts, and like you wanted to meet like with a random person at a random date like you had no plan no arrangements like how would you do it and like what kind of holidays social norms like everything you know would you implement and he's kind of like well like the place where people would meet up would be i don't know times square in new york new year's eve fireworks and i was like what and yeah the whole episode kind of just deploys that so even without like six degrees of separation like even without you like having a phone or like arranging something you can still think about well either where the whole world usually would want to be at exact periods of time or well where that person might be based well that was off topic (laughs) so now that we are done with the topic that fascinates only me so they're still at this hotel, right? And, uh, well, there's this raid going on. And Olsen even gets, like, suspicious of, like, the people kind of lurking around. And he's like, well, which one of these? Like, I can sense that one of them must be, like, an undercover cop. And he'll kind of still, again, thinks on his feet. And says, well, I've heard there were all these, like, peace protests in town. And I think, like, somebody's just investigating, like, a bomb threat. You know, nothing to panic about. But still, because Olsen is kind of, like, freaked out... They go to uh, Hill's room. Hill is Chris Roberts that also knows, right? Yep, the spy. Cool. So they are now sitting in the room and Sid is there. And Hill says like he has done this on purpose because he knows that they wanted to track now. And again, because of this panic attack like that they have had in the hole, he kind of wanted to like reassure us and like, yeah, there's nothing to worry about here, Thief. So he goes into the toilet. <laughs> it's just the best part of this fucking podcast because there's like at least three minutes of, of Charles Hill telling a story about he made sure to make noises to sound like he's shitting and taking his time in the toilet. And he does this so that Jan Olsen can go through his documents and kind of reassure himself like, yep, yeah, this is all legit, it's all fine. He is who he says he is. Again, as a power move, Olsen kind of does like something, well, weird. He asks Charles Hill as Chris Roberts to meet with him in private. He's like, yeah, listen, and meet me in an unknown car. Let's go to the unknown location. It's kind of like midnight. But Charles is obviously smart, so he does go downstairs to meet with him. And he kind of, you know, like when you enter the car, but you pull your leg up so that that nobody can shut the door on you. And he says, like, I'm not going anywhere with you tonight. You can stay here and wait, you know, until the morning. Well, like, we're all professionals. But still, Olsen actually kind of just follows him to the room and it's just there while Tukiel is sleeping and staying overnight, just monitoring him. And then again in that power trip where they're building trust, Olsen invites them to spend some time with him on a fjord. So he's like, hey, listen, me and Charles are gonna, you know, go here, like Sid and the other group are gonna go like to separate houses. You can here really see here that they're like on the edge of their nerves. Sid, who is the muscle of the operation, goes with like some of Olsen's men to Oslo to like pick up the money. And then, you know, they're just monitoring that that arrives safely. While Charles is just in general being terrified by Olsen by now because he's losing his sleep. He has not had sleep like he's been monitoring Charles Hill here. But he's also just like under such huge stress that, you know, even though the two of them are now, well, supposed to go to the fjord together, Hill is kind of like losing his sense, like he's driving super fast, like just not stopping. There's nothing like you can even do. 
and he's just bringing like irrational decisions so he brings him to this field to like this house right and now well that's already a huge fucking risk and super dumb movie i like just bring him to my fucking house this random person is supposed to give me money for a stolen art piece and he basically just tells here like yeah the painting is in the basement go into the basement now if you are anything like me you are screaming inside and be like don't go don't go but what else can he fucking do just picture this, right? Sid is there with the cash. And on the other side you have Charles Hill who had just went into the basement and is, well, shown the painting. And now he needs to verify the legitimacy of it. So he said the test was, well, a couple of things. First of all, when he first, like, picked up the painting, from the back it didn't look like Monk's painting, so you had to, like, turn it around to actually see like all the layers that he has done. But the true key to this painting and showing that it is original and what he was really looking for was the spilled candle wax, which Munk has actually just carelessly split over the canvas and it was the proof of the authenticity of the painting. So it was an actual stamp of it. So the transaction goes through, right? And he actually said like, as he was putting the painting into the car, he has actually damaged it. Just like, oh my god, like screaming inside, you know, making that screaming fucking face. And as now they're getting out of there with the painting, the police is kind of like going in into like circling around the house. But all of a sudden bursts out the exit and um, he legs it, but makes it to a phone booth. And then he's like, you know what, there's there's no point. So he calls Leaflier, the, you know, chief inspector, whatever his thing was in um, Oslo. And he says, listen, like, fuck it, the police is looking for me anyways. Can I uh, take the cab to the station and you can pay the fare once I'm there? (laughs) Which is like one of the coolest turning in themselves in stories. Like, yeah, listen, you just pay the cab. I'm there. I'm your man. So now only three months after the painting was stolen, it was returned to the museum. And Phil Anger was sentenced to six years and three months. Previously, as I mentioned, he stole the vampire and he spent four years in prison for that. And he was like super theatrical during his trial. He would even scream like, I'm innocent. He threw a water bottle onto the courtroom floor. He even like, it says, hustled out of the courtroom, but was brought back in after 20 minutes. Clear anger management issues. Like Also, who allowed him to just like hustle out of the courtroom and then gone back? Like, when somebody says he hustled out, I just imagine somebody is just, like, leisurely getting the fuck out as they, you know, righteously need to do at that very moment in time. The other members of the gang only got a couple of months, but there's a catch. And this, like, has made me, after that whole episode, I was like, for fuck's sake, why did I listen to this? So I had to put you all through it. Because there's a catch. All of them have been released on the technicality. The technicality here being that the British agent involved in this thing operation entered Norway under false identity, and that was illegal at the time. So, yeah, all of that, but hey, at least they got the painting, right? Victory, yay! And Anger, this is probably the most, I don't know, crucial in a way part, because this guy, well, obviously stole Munch's paintings before. So in 2002, Anger actually bought on an auction, one of Mung's paintings for $1,500. And when leaving, was actually congratulated by the National Gallery head of security, who said, it's great that you actually bought a Mung painting, much better than stealing one. <laughs> it's like congratulations, Anger, for not being a piece of shit, causing us to actually deploy a spy against you for once. And now let's go into the true core of this story and the actual background. The only kind of information here that you can say we have, well, is either on Paul Anger or on the painting and the artist themselves. So Paul Anger, as I said, has stolen the painting by Moon called Vampire in 1988. And even while in prison, he was kind of like, hey, you know how I was like professional footballer, but now I'm into art. So he even during that prison sentence started painting. And he opened even his own first exhibition in 2011. This guy was like, I turned it around, I twisted it, turned it around. I'm the Bob Ross in this fucking Norwegian. Like, I'm the Norwegian Bob Ross here. Did you ever listen to Bob Ross on Calm, like, to get yourself to sleep? 
I'm revealing a lot about myself today. I don't know if I like it. I don't know if you needed all of this fucking information for me. And I just love this information. So basically, you know how he played football professionally. So suddenly he started like throwing away all these like football, you know, suits, uniforms, whatever you fucking call it. It's not called uniform. <laughs> and he would say to like the, co- the f- other footballers like, hey, it's not worth washing them. So they were like, uh, the fuck do you mean? And they started following him and they realized that, uh, well, he was actually getting more money from his side gig, which was just stealing arts, jewels and just cash in general. And then when they reported him and the police raided his house, they discovered Munch's vampire just casually lying in his living room. So he has gone against all of the Maya Bible rules, which, as you remember, one of them is don't go for a celebrity, right? Lower your standards a bit. In this celebrity, in this case, the celebrity has been, yes, the painter and the painting, okay? Don't go for it. Stop obsessing. So I put, what about the victim in this case, which was clearly the painting? (laughs) Well, the scream wasn't named the scream, per se, to begin with. It was named the Schei der Natur, or the scream of nature. Or the Norwegian title for the painting is just Skrik or Shriek. As we know, it symbolizes the anxiety of the human condition. Got a lot Wikipedia. I know how I recognize now, even. It's like, no, this is definitely from Wikipedia. Somebody was just like, let me go whole poetic on this shit. Munch himself was a Norwegian painter and graphic artist. He worked in Germany as well as his home country. And he was one of those people really pushing the expressionist movement. So what's expressionism? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a modernist movement that originated in Germany in the beginning of the 20th century. And it's a like the typical feature of all of the paintings is the subjective perspective, meaning that it's supposed to distort the perspective and also to provoke the emotional effect in order to like evoke people's moods and just like ideas and to yes, yeah, strike up the emotion in a person. And boy, does this one deliver. So he had like this super happy monk, had this super happy series that was called Freeze of Life where he just portrays sickness, death, anxiety, and love as the central themes, in which Scream was one of the featured paintings, as well as Madonna. That thing is haunting as well. He recalled he'd been out for a walk in the sunset, when suddenly the sunset turned the clouds a brown red. A brown... A blood red. <laughs> I'm laughing because when I said, like, because immediately when I read this, I was like, this is like when people stop in the middle of the fucking road to take pictures of sunset when it's like even remotely red or like orange, it's like, oh my god, the sky change color. Everybody on, Insta- <laughs> on Instagram would love this. Let me hashtag this straight up. Hashtag sunset. Hashtag red sunset. <laughs> it's like Moon is turning in his fucking grave for your hashtags here, hashtags there, while he was like, I was... I- started a movement I like fucking expressionism and everything like you're shitting all over my work so while he was on his walk he didn't just you know I mean he did stop <laughs> he technically would have probably posted on Instagram had he lived today but he sensed an infinite scream passing through nature super positive guy I just love this next paragraph because it says scholars um, have located a spot of the fjord overlooking Oslo and then it gives like the coordinates to the fucking horse if just if you want to go and just go fucking insane like he clearly did and they have suggested the explanations for this unnaturally orange sky and it range from it ranges from the effects of a volcanic eruption to the psychological reaction by moon to his sister's commitment at a nearby lunatic asylum. So, like, his sisters, this part is correct. And everybody's kind of like, yeah, this he portrays anxiety through, like, well, his sister's anxiety and, like, first-hand experience of that. <laughs> but I just, I just put here, I love scholars. It's like, how can we twist this and turn it and bullshit it through, like, to find some deep-ass meaning to it? There are two versions of it. So one version is in paint. That's the one that was stolen and that had like the candle wax. The other one is in pastels. And the art dealer at the time estimated that um, this painting could sell for over 100 million. And this would make it the most expensive painting in the world. 
Now, before going into motives, I just like had this paragraph because while researching, obviously, on Munk, I was like, okay, cool. So his sister was like in the mental asylum. That sounds like interesting family dynamic. And yeah, there is like some other interesting bits within his family. So he said himself that he inherited the seeds of madness from his dad, who was temperamentally nervous and obsessively religious, which I feel is just the saddest fucking combination. I just imagine him being like, is there God? But like, what if I'm question? I'm questioning everything. Is there God in this person? How many times do I need to pray? Everybody pray. Why are you not praying right now? It's just like the person being on edge, but then like trying to push religion into everybody. And death kind of wasn't a stranger to his family. Like his mom died when he was young. And then his dad would say that the mother is looking down from heaven and grieving over their misbehavior when they would misbehave. Which, I mean, parenting advice. <laughs> like, I don't think I have to be a parent to tell you this was different times and don't do it now. You know, don't blame like your children directly to like their mom's death. Maybe it will traumatize them for life. His brother, so like one of his five siblings married but then died like a few months after the wedding. And then, as we know, like one of his sisters was diagnosed with mental illness and she was actually diagnosed at the early age and then had to be committed to this insane asylum. So all of this kind of like heavily affected Munch. To the point that he said, I inherited two of mankind's most frightful enemies, the heritage of consumption and insanity. Well, that just tells you all, doesn't it? Now, let's go a bit into motives and what might have motivated the guys to actually steal one of the infamous paintings in the world. So here I have obviously bits and pieces from the story. So if you ask the police, obviously they think like, yep, it was seized for purely financial motives. And this is like according to the government officials and just people that were in the art industry in Norway at that time. The defense lawyers for Paul Anger actually said that they think it's a stunt for the client, that they wanted to be famous and do something big in his life. But then if you ask Charles Hill, well, who has actually, as I mentioned, recovered different art paintings, so I hope he'd know. He said himself that this is kind of like a disease for them. Quote, there is a madness that afflicts these people. They are not necessarily art lovers, but they view the works as trophies, end quote. So I think that's interesting, in particular just because, like, obviously I'm looking at something like this for the first time. So I think it's super interesting to think about it, like, the same way, I don't know, a serial killer would think about trophies that they steal from their victims. Because in this case, you can kind of view the galleries or just the art and the society in general as like a whole ass victim. And then they just go for the most valuable thing to keep as a trophy and like it kind of means something to them. I think to Paul Anger, out of all of them, it kind of meant probably the most. And I think for him, definitely, it wasn't just the monetary profit. As we know, he has actually paid to own, like, one of his own. Like, he has actually, you know, went then to, well, have his own exhibitions and have his own paintings. So I think for him in particular, there's probably somebody, well, if nobody is doing this, there probably should be, like, a whole S category of... People looking at just victimology of art in general. Just because I think it's actually a lot deeper than probably people portray to be. Because as I mentioned, if you look at, I don't know, a particular movement like here, like expressionist movement, and then you're like, okay, cool. This is like the pool of victims, right? Like everybody painting in this movement is particularly affecting me. There's something triggering me. To go after let's say those particular paintings and then quite like a serial killer you're like looking for stuff that will make either the most impact or that is somehow very deeply like you are deeply fixated on because of let's say your inner anxieties or just the relation you have to the painting i feel like even just me who's not an art connoisseur or anything just by looking at Moog's paintings like it provokes some sort of reaction in me and it heavily depends on the mood of the day like sometimes i can look at it for like five minutes straight let's say and i could be like yeah but this is a haunting fucking painting but you know i don't like feel much connection to it that's probably when i'm in the good mood because I feel like it has layers also, I feel like it has like inscriptions in the back as well. And it's just the colors and, and the beauty of it, and like with every single painting of his, but like this one in particular, like if I am unnerved or like, I don't know, unhinged on that day, 
I can look at it from a completely different angle and be like, okay, this is actually disturbing. I can't stare at this for longer than like five seconds. So yeah, let me know if anybody is actually looking into this as the proper study of, you know, pool of victims, paintings. And why do people choose to go after some of them in particular? Because here I feel like we have a proper fixation with Moong's work in particular. Like, I don't think Paul Anger would have gone just for any painting. So that's why I don't feel like it's purely monetary benefit from him. Yes, for like maybe the other members of the gang, they were like, yeah, whatever, still, we'll help you out. Like, we can get some sick money out of it. But I think for him in particular, it meant something deeper. And yeah, when you look at the screen, please podbam at gmail.com me what do you see and does it depend on your mood like with me or you know does the painting just not affect you at all and then like what movement maybe affects you yeah let's talk about paintings this month Vinny I suck at painting I suck at the art class <laughs> this is the actual this is the only thing that actually triggered my fucking anger in school this is a sideline story if you didn't fucking notice right <laughs> we're done with the case but yeah, basically in school, I had this moment when I burst and like my parents have never seen me like this, like based on school. I mean, they have seen me like angry, okay. <laughs> I love how I'm like making it sound like, yeah, I have anger management issues, which I kind of do. But as in, they knew like certain injustices would provoke it, like, but it usually wasn't connected to school because I was like, yeah, but there's like, you know, I'll, I'll get some grades, it's fine. So there was this fucking just it was just like in our art class I think we had something which was like yeah but unannounced test like yeah paint this and what I used to do obviously is give somebody else to do all of my fucking paintings so that I get graded for them because I was like it's art you know that people are doing this come on it's like I'm not going to allow the lack of my talent to make me fail a class because of an arts class like are we okay so yes, in my head, this was an injustice. The fact that we had like an art test, which was again like, hey, paint a girl with a pearl earring. I was like, what the actual fuck? Okay, speaking of paintings, that's one painting where like I obsessed with the book and I fucking enjoy the painting just visually. If I was to ever have like a single painting in my house, it would be that. And also because of the movie Scarlet. <laughs> Scarlet is a prevalent theme in the past month. Basically, I just stormed into the house and I was like, this is insane. Like, this is a blasphemy. <laughs> and my parents were like, okay. My dad literally like, stormed after me. It was like, what in the actual fuck is up? We have never seen her this upset over school. I was like, she had a surprise fucking this. How dare she? But I was like, calm down. It's an arts class. Like, why are you pissed? But I literally lost my mind. Also, there is between my high school and my home, there was like at least 20 minute walk. So like I ha I've been fuming and like containing my fucking anger for like good 20 minutes. This is why I need therapy. <laughs> because I can simmer on that fucking anger inside for a long ass time and then just explode. Yeah. Yeah, Maya, it's good that if you, if you never commit crimes and this cannot be used as evidence against you for fuck's sake. All right, all right, all right. So for this next section, I was like, okay, let me look up like some haunted museums, right? Usually, museums are not haunted as a whole. That's what I realized from this Google search that was super quick. It's usually parts of them, parts of them relating to art or like staircases and weird shit like that are haunted. By the way, you can always email me to podbam at gmail.com or just hit me up on Instagram or Twitter, deadbandpod, for the suggestions for these mini stories. Because I understand I'm not an expert on, well, most of the big true crime stories either, but most definitely not on haunting stuff. I listen to it on podcasts, it kind of fascinates me to a certain degree, but then I'm like, wait. So, from the non-expert here, it comes the unlucky mummy from the British Museum. Why is there no different word for that object? Why is it called mummy? It's, it's as if in my language, it's mumia man. It's like as if in my language, like suddenly it's, someone's like, yeah, no mum, like let's call the same. Let's call this creepy ass statue. Yeah, yeah, let's call it mummy. Wait. So there's this whole unlucky mummy that's like Egyptian mummy that's stored this piece of art in the British Museum and it apparently has caused certain deaths on the Titanic. So you see, when I read this, I was like, wait, it's the same way. The catch, however, is that this artifact is only wooden plaster mummy board, so it's not actually like mummy inside. Because that would require embalming and shit, wouldn't it? I don't know. <laughs> 
However, there are hieroglyphs on this inscription that suggest that the owner was no one else but the high priestess of Amen-Ra. And since its finding in the 1880s, this artifact was shrouded in mystery. Just because it's like a picture of this woman's face, it's like kind of like strange, it's supposed to look beautiful, but you kind of know it's, you know, has that malign expression, has that like resting bitch face. So they brought it here from Egypt in the 19th century. And this is what pisses me off with like Egyptian artifacts. People don't understand it, but they're like, ooh, fascinated by it and they purchase it. There is some deep dark magic in those roots, okay? It's like, you wouldn't mess with Philosopher's Stone from Harry Potter. Why are you messing with this when you don't understand it? You don't understand its powers. So this amateur green archaeologist, Thomas Douglas Murray, was basically bargaining in Egypt and got this case. But he also became the first victim of the mummy because as soon as he got it, he was about to go to Europe, right? Well, he had a weapon accident, ended up with an injured arm, but he got infected and then, well, he lost the arm to amputation. So he ended up being the first victim. Don't bargain with artifacts you don't understand. So this tragic sad story is going to continue because everybody handling this artifact now is going to have some misfortune. But this next line is the best sentence and it comes with a word I have never heard in my fucking life. Two servants who had handled the mummy case, perhaps without sufficient respect, both died within a 12 month. Wait, no, not within 12 months. Within a 12 month, 12 month is a word. Whilst a far swifter fate overtook a third who had made some jesting Sally. What the fuck is jesting Sally? I need to Google words. I hate language for those times. It's a synonym and it's just like a synonym for prank. I don't get it. It's so great being an immigrant sometimes. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Like our language is so much more beautiful. And we don't have to put two synonyms together to explain a motherfucking thing. <laughs> it's like my pissed at English language right now. Modales, por favor. Finally, in the UK, it reached this woman called Miss Warwick Hunt, and she received it as a gift, but then, obviously, again, misfortune followed, and she has lost, like, considerable wealth that she has amassed. So, she ended up being the person who was like, yeah, let's pass it on to the British Museum. I don't need this fucking thing. Like, I'm literally poor right now. Like, take this thing away from me. It's a jinx. After this, this journalist Bertram Fletcher Robinson was kind of called to investigate the curse. He was like, yeah, it's really curse. What the fuck is all with all of this? But, so he is investigating this, and listen to this, before he could finish the investigation, all of a sudden, he passes away. What the actual fuck? This, this right here, is why I didn't pursue career in journalism. No, no nothing else. This, this right here. Now, this death and everything is kind of raising the interest, and guess who enters the scene? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Remember him from the Agatha disappearance, and because he's the writer of Sherlock Holmes? As we have learned then, or like if you didn't listen to that episode, which is one of my golden ones, you need to listen to that shit. Arthur Conan Doyle was a brilliant writer, but was also an attention whore. Basically, I'm listening to the audiobook on Sherlock now by Stephen Fry. Well, narrated by Stephen Fry. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle still wrote it. And basically, it was kind of like a prelude to like one of the books, which was like The Return of Sherlock, because he killed Sherlock off. So like, I never understood that book because also it was just like pushing it. And then the public was obviously like, oh my god, how dare you, you know, we want more Sherlock. And he was like, yeah, Sherlock is alive, hey, there's more books now. Plus with that whole Agatha disappearance, he's just like an attention who is like, oh my god, my fame is like kind of dwindling. It's that dwindling fame. Dwindle, dwindle, little fame. Okay, so his fame was dwindling. <laughs> Why can I not say the fucking word? And every time he does, he's like, ooh, what's the biggest story in the news? Well, it appears to be this, here I come. His contribution, though, was one sentence. That this was caused by Egyptian elementals guarding the female mummy because Mr. Robinson had begun an investigation of the stories of the mummy's malevolence. Wow, groundbreaking. Also, elementals guarding the female mummy. This should be the commercial for periods. This should be a commercial for, like, pads and tampons. <laughs> Elementals guarding the female in her most moody days. Enter another journalist, Steed, in 1912, who actually found himself on board the Titanic as the first class passenger. He was actually about to like go receive like Nobel Prize and shit. And he embarked on this journey to participate in the Congress in Carnegie Hall and was invited personally by President Taft. But you guessed it, he doesn't make it. 
Why should I say more? Because the Titanic, it sank, right? People didn't survive. You've seen it. Leonardo DiCaprio, you've seen him. And one of the survivors actually said that Steed has shared the story of the mummy and that this might be why, well, the Titanic has happened. And people started speculating that the British Museum wanted to get rid of the mummy because of this bad luck, so that it was actually on this ship to be transported to the US. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why the Titanic hit the iceberg and broke into two pieces. Fuck yeah. So the moral of this story is that the, this journalist, for Robinson, they have said he has died of typhoid fever, which was kind of like common at the time, but he was like, it was the elementals of the mummy, right? People, how many people have died on Titanic? I didn't look that up, but a lot, okay. But this mummy apparently survived. Mm, nothing happened to this bitch. And like then, you know, she's kind of like in chilling in British Museum now. Do you believe any of it? Do you believe it has caused the Titanic to sink this powerful Egyptian thing? I wouldn't fuck with it. Apparently, whoever sp spoke of it, some misfortune happened to it. But yeah, um, so am I, am I scared right now? Mm, kind of, but I also already kind of have like a shitty life. So maybe, maybe I'm testing the grounds and I should not be doing that. Yes, because I already have a shitty one. <laughs> But it can always get shittier, right? Isn't that what I fucking teach every Monday? I end this on such a positive note. I know what you missed last week. You missed me actually saluting and telling you what podcast you're listening to. Yeah, I didn't do that, did I, genius? But then what you missed the most is me sending you off to the next Zoom call. Because aren't those moments tragic? I'm gonna put the link below for this to make sense. But I wanted to share like on the podcast as well. This part is for the people that kind of hate the jobs they're in. I would suggest doing this before your next Zoom call, before your next meeting, or the best, what I have done for a long last time, before actually going into the shift. So like, I don't know, when you're leaving the tube, or when you're leaving the house, or just before you go into the office, or like on the shit there, you know, taking your morning dump. Have a pre-login mantra, okay? First of all, like even before you open that laptop, try, if you if you really hate your job and want to move on, to motivate yourself to move on, have that login picture, you know how you have a picture and then you have your passport. Passport. <laughs> password. Yeah, have that login picture, be the saddest looking picture of you. Just to be like, yeah, bitch, do you want to look like this forever and ever? I don't know, I found that that helps. <laughs> Maybe you want sunshine and butterflies to, you know, get you into the mood for me. No, this is like, move the fuck on from this job. And then before you log in, before you move on with your work, think of your own mantra. Something that like, you know, affects you so that you sort of isolate yourself, disassociate at your best. And then, yeah, just explain to yourself, this cannot affect me. My own goes usually something like, this is not your job, your life is the job you care about, this is just a means of getting you money and surviving, so for the next nine hours you're gonna do your shift, but because it's not your job, because it's not what you care about, nothing that happens during the shift can affect you, nothing can anger you, you can't bring you to the outside life. And then I kind of end with like, ooh, a witty note where I'm like, yeah, I'm hilarious. And I say something like, yeah, you don't bring a side chick into your marriage or like some weird shit like that. <laughs> Just to add it with like zesty ass note. So yes, this outro won't apply to everybody, but only to those who really hate their jobs. I found that it helps me, honestly. Because then during that shift, I remind myself on it. I'm like, are you, are you letting yourself get affected by this? Why? You, you don't care. You don't care so much. Like, why? how are you affected by this right now? And then, yeah, I immediately snap out of it. Why I find it works is just because of those reminders and I can always have that in the back of my head because I used to like get carried away and then not sleep and think about work at like 3 in the morning I was like, this is just not it. <laughs> when I don't care about the job, this is not it. I suck my beauty sleep. I'm already white. I'm already aging like a white bitch. Like, this is not it. So yeah, I hope this helps somebody. If it doesn't, thanks for listening anyways. And until next Monday... Keep making your own world and the world of others a better place. One motive at a time. Bye, fuckers. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's good.